everybody says to me, you know, they, they come up and say, holy smokes, says, how do you always get such a damn great band together? You know, I've always got a good band, they say. And I say, it's simple as can be. When you sing as bad as I do, you've got to have a good band. <laughs> I've got no choice. <laughs> Ronnie was a contemporary of Elvis and Bill Haley, Chuck Berry and Little Richard. Elvis became rock's first superstar. Ronnie and many like him expected that eventually they too would hit the big time. They're still waiting. tomorrow. Well, I've been lucky since 1952. I've gone further and made more money than any other artist in the world with the same amount of talent. <laughs> Ronnie Hawkins may be convinced that his earnings to talent ratio is high, but the same might be said of the entire record industry. Go. Hit it. The search for new talent is relentless and highly speculative. Each of the major record companies maintains its own A&R man, artists and repertoire. Kinney's A&R man is John David Churchill Poser. His job is to seek out new talent, which is to be found in bars, clubs, high schools, or maybe one of the 50 or so demo tapes he runs through each week. I got a hot one. Can you... Well, uh, can you just leave him for a second, bring Mike in for listening to the tape? All right? Thanks, old man. Okay, five-man group. We don't have a blues band anywhere in our Kinney family. Uh, um, I wouldn't say we don't have a blues band. Well, we don't have a Canadian blues band. Uh, they've got a hell of a good following, so... We, you know, I, as far as looking at the money, investing it, uh, we can make our money back and, and uh, profit, I know it. I ain't got a nickel. Just another high school gig for Whiskey Howl. Maybe. But now that Poser is interested, the question is raised. Can the magic of Kinney music transform them into the new rock sensation? Superstars even, or maybe just stars? Kinney will rely on Poser's instinct for what is good and what is bad. That is, for what will sell and what won't. Talk about shaking up, woman. Poser has decided to gamble on Whiskey Howl. They will be introduced to the Kinney family through the industry ritual of a contract signing. We're starting off with an album. The album will be recorded uh, as soon as we can uh, firm up to the uh, producer. And it'll be up to him and you guys. I'll, I'll give you some freedom, like the freedom you want. Do it your way. And as long as you do it properly and it makes sense and sells records, we'll continue that on that basis. If there are problems, then we will have to somehow solve it. But I don't want to police you to the point that you can't be creative. Because, like, you guys will lose out in the end anyway. If we police you too much, if we make you into something that the market should be, then you'll have problems. 
Yeah. You're going to sit here and read it. Yeah. No, I've read it. Don't read it. Just sign. I've read it. Before. How do you spell it? X. Good morning, Captain Gordon. Yeah. The buying and selling of talent is, of course, what a record company is all about. So, we heard the tape. You heard, do you like it? Beautiful. Absolutely fantastic, really. What do we do now, then? Well, uh... John McLeod, a lawyer for Capitol Records, is often called in to negotiate a purchase. What you're looking for. What I'm looking for in a time factor is, uh a two-year contract with three one-year options rather than one and four. Uh, $30,000 for the first album and guaranteed for the other two albums, plus guaranteed release in the States and 12% of retail. We're really uh, $30,000. McLeod is being approached by Dennis Murphy, a freelance producer who puts together talent, financing, and facilities for sale to one of the majors. He takes his own risks, pockets his own profits just to break even. Right, which is hard in Canada, but that's why I'm talking about an American release, because that's where the market is. That's, in, in, other words, in your you, business and my business, that's your Your, your $30,000 figure would be worldwide, then, is that what you're talking about? You know, I don't think we really have to talk about that, because that is a whole other factor. Uh, I verbally have, have made you an offer, which this afternoon I'll put in writing and send to you. Okay. And at that point, you can either reject that or at least give me a counteroffer, and at least I'll know what you're talking about. Okay. Each major has a stable of artists on long-term contract. Aarons and Ackley are part of the Capitol stable. Their first album was a commercial flop. Dennis Murphy was their producer on contract to Capitol. He is again, but this time with strict instructions to make the album commercial. Tonight you could have some singers singing that melody line, repeating it again. You know, right. fade, even uh, like fading out really quickly. Right. 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 <laughs> Dennis was once a musician, but as he himself admits, not a very good one. Instead, he developed his flair for producing, and now works in the gray area between those who make the music and those who market it. Because you're going to open it, right? With eight bars of that. commercial cuts that's going to be on the album too there's yeah. really going to be a lot of stuff there's a lot of yeah but then we get back into our old argument about what is commercial commercial is what i like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and what the public eventually likes that they buy the so yeah. yeah yeah so what do you got to show depending us? on which route we want to go this to be a color shot <coughs> then the home. thing opens up and it's a mess Oh, right? Oh, wow. Now, this is really a takeoff of something uh, Dennis and I were talking about uh, last week, about uh, including a game in a double jacket. Every marketing ploy will be used to make the album a success. Monopoly-type game right. to have on the inside spread. Although it will cost only 18 cents to print the record, they may spend up to $2 for the album cover. 
if somebody steals your equipment, and you, you know. What else? Screwed by a record company, go back yeah. to the space. Yeah. <laughs> the whole game thing that I was thinking about should be something that nobody, that you couldn't remove from the cover. It would have to be an insert. That's so good, yeah, mm -hmm. but that's so good that people who would not normally buy an Aaron's and Ackley album <coughs> will buy the game uh, and have an Aaron's and Ackley album around the house, which they'll listen to, and it'll turn people on to music who otherwise would never listen. SD 66001, 002, and 003. Maybe. To sell the records, the majors maintain a nationwide string of promotion men. They have purposely chosen a number of young people who in the 60s were attracted to the industry by the optimistic message of the music itself. They soon found themselves a part of the very system they set out to change. It's the system. And you no, it, the is system. A, it is a pretty good system that we oh. have. Dynamite system. When, like, I didn't, we, when we first started doing the Contra deal, you know, like, it started here mostly, you know, with the branch manager here. Too. Robert Nickford is Kinney's man in Montreal. He is being approached by Sham FM for free samples of new product. Well, you, you have budgets. I mean, you just can't go and give records away, you know. Like, Jacques's going to say, well, Robert, uh, can't you sell any? And I'm going to say, well, no, not really. Uh, you know, just promotion, man. Like, all the guys are going to get turned on. They're going to get to know the product, and they'll get into it. They'll bite into it. and will get sales from it. They'll say, yeah, that's very good, but maybe they must have a budget too, just like we have promotional budgets. So he'll get on the phone and call Vareka and say, hey, Bill, man, well, what's happening, you know? You guys are ordering 100 records, but you know I can't give you 100 records free. Bill will say, well, okay, well, what can you give me free? Well, I can give you one or two of each. Okay, build me the others at a dollar a piece. And that's what happens. So then he turns around to me and says, look, Robert, you're really not doing your job, you understand? Let's you know? go 50-50. We'll pay 50 cents a piece for all the records. Well, no, that, that's something you can't do. Well, we could work it out where uh, one free for oh, everyone well, you okay. buy. However you word it. <laughs> it's yeah, that's the deal, you know? Well, that's something else that uh, I'll have to speak with the proper authority because it's a protocol that I have to respect. There's certain things that I could decide on my own, but there's certain things that okay. you have, you know, like everybody likes you to speak to your immediate superior. So, like, you know... <laughs> You gotta, gotta abide to those rules, man. Otherwise, you become a renegade and a rebel. <laughs> and uh, nobody likes rebels within an industry, you know, a company. Okay, so we've got that settled, I think. So, like, but for now, this order, man, you want, you want, why don't you pay for, for them if you can? That's what... Okay, we'll pay for them. But are you still going to be my friend? Sure. Oh, sure, always. Yeah? Sure. This is fair. This, I feel, is fair enough. I'll stick with you on that one. Good. Okay, now we can go back to the order. It's ten minutes before five o'clock. My name's Angus. Time for me to get on out of here. Then he'll be with you, and uh, he'll take you through till nine o'clock tonight. Hope you had yourself a good day. Till I see you tomorrow at one. Be good to yourselves, and be good to your brothers and sisters, too. Well, still a child. This is Sham FM. No bubble gum here. They take themselves seriously. C-H-O-M FM in Montreal. <laughs> Originally the preserve of the classics, FM became a prime outlet for serious rock. By the 60s, it had become underground radio, the medium of the counterculture. Underground attracted groups like Crowbar, rock musicians who embraced the counterculture and its lifestyle. They sought a harmony between their lives and their music, each a reflection of the other. And it's a long extension cord from the Time and Half Club. For them, rock and roll has reached maturity, has come of age. when you're rather than just going back why don't you do a
This idyllic existence has to be supported with cash. This means regular forays into the marketplace. Yeah. Oh! <laughs> Look at all that. Blood money. Let's give it all back. You got the counter or what? Saturday evening, Barry, Ontario. Crowbar backstage. Biggest pregnant month in the Music isn't that lucrative, but in aesthetic value. Uh, you got any spare change for yeah, spare change. Oh. cigarettes? Spare change, really? Cigarette. Spare change, 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 man. Spare change. Please, man, I haven't had a meal in almost change? three minutes. Listen, I here. really need some spare oh. change. Listen, Thank you, man. You'll never you should buy yourself a white shirt. Excuse me. I have my wife in the phone. Oh, yeah. Wait a minute. I want the money. Give me more. 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 Give me That night, in a small town in northern Ontario, 2,000 kids paid a $3 admission to the local armory to boogie on Crowbar. <laughs>